We are reading Touching Spirit Bear, and this is chapter 24. The next morning, Cole went to the totem to carve his anger dance. He stared at the blank space at the bottom of the pole. What figure or shape would express what he had learned during the dance? He knew one thing. Nobody ever woke up in the morning and chose to be angry. That meant that if he remained angry, something outside him controlled him. Cole didn't like the idea of being under the control of anybody or anything. So what could he carve to show he was sorry and that he had learned to forgive? What could he carve to show the healing that had taken place and the understanding he felt? Cole left the space untouched and returned to the cabin. I danced the dance of anger, Cole announced during Edwin's next visit. Edwin glanced at him. What did you learn? To forgive, Cole said. Being angry is giving someone else control of my feelings, so they own me. Forgiving gives me control again. And what did you carve in the totem to show forgiveness? Nothing yet, Cole murmured. There's still something missing. It isn't enough to be sorry and forgive. Somehow I have to figure out a way to help Peter. Until then, I'll never be able to carve anything in the blank space. That's what I had to discover before I could heal, wasn't it? Edwin smiled slightly and nodded. How to help Peter heal is something that will haunt you and stay in your thoughts like a sliver under your skin. The harm you did to him will fester and pain you all of your life unless you're able to make up for it. And what if I can't help Peter? Cole asked, worried. Then you need to help someone else. Is that why you and Garvey have helped me so much? Edwin nodded, then turned and walked toward the boat. Cole could tell he was struggling to contain his emotions. As the short North Country summer passed, Edwin's visits grew less frequent. When he did come to the island, he spoke little, as if something was bothering him. He stayed only long enough to unload supplies, pick up Cole's school assignments, and look at the totem. Each visit, the totem had a new carving, but Edwin always seemed to focus on the blank space at the bottom of the pole, although he made no comment. By the end of summer, Cole had carved a seal's head, a sparrow in a nest, and a raven. There were dozens of the huge blackbirds hanging out in the trees around camp, cawing for handouts at mealtime. Cole also carved a jagged bolt of lightning and a big raindrop after dancing a storm dance. By September, the salmon began working their way upstream to spawn. Each day during his soak, Cole watched them. He could see them leaping high out of the water, trying to make their way up through the gushing gorge of water above the pond. When the salmon run finished several weeks later, Cole danced their dance and carved their fig figure into his totem. During late summer and early fall, Cole had spotted the spear bear every few days as it wandered along the shore outside the bay or drank from the stream near the pond. But gradually, as winter gained a grip on the island, the sightings ended and the fresh tracks disappeared. Cole knew that the spirit bear had found a cave somewhere or dug out a hollow under a fallen tree to hibernate. Cole stubbornly kept visiting the pond for his morning soak, even though the water numbed him in minutes. Because of the bitter winds that winter brought, Cole spent more and more time holed up inside the warm cabin. Sometimes the winds blew so hard, the draft through the cabin blew out his lantern. He stuffed paper, cloth, moss, tinfoil, and anything else he could find into the cracks. Every two hours, he got up during the night to stoke the fire. Nights when he failed to get up, he paid the price by having to start a new fire from scratch while he shivered in his underwear. Carving on the totem became almost impossible. The icy cold stiffened Cole's joints and made his fingers numb and awkward. Several times he cut himself, prying his knife against the slippery wood. He also quit trying to collect firewood. Now, whole weeks passed without any let-up of the rain. Everything became soggy, and Cole was glad he had cut and stacked a huge wood pile. The last thing Cole gave up was carrying the ancestor rock and soaking in the pond. Walking over the frosty rocks along the stream bed became too treacherous. Even when he hiked near the tree line, icy winds pierced his jacket and left him chilled. Winter's daily routine settled into splitting firewood, carrying water up from the stream, cooking, reading, and doing schoolwork. Any fishing now was strictly for food, not sport. Cole kept track of time with an old calendar he found in the supplies. 
Each night before going to bed, he took a pencil and marked off that day. When he turned the page to a new month, he treated himself to a candy bar. Edwin never brought many candy bars with the supplies. Being confined allowed Cole more time for schoolwork, but also more time to think about being alone. Some nights, he cried himself to sleep from loneliness. He couldn't help it. The silence became overpowering, and he longed to hear another human voice. He noticed his own voice getting hoarse and higher-pitched from lack of use. If only Edwin would visit more often. The Clinket elder's quiet presence was better than the endless hours alone. During the long nights, Cole thought a lot about Garvey, about his mom, and about his dad. Had his father changed at all? And what about Peter? Cole still could not think of a way to help him. Edwin had said during his last visit that Peter was growing more bitter and depressed, hardly talking to anyone, even his parents. Without the daily soaks and carving the totem, Cole found it harder to end each day with his mind clear and still. Sometimes anger crept back. It was all as if it was as if it waited for him to blow out the lantern each night. Then Cole felt a growing resentment that he was being forced to endure this lonely existence. At these times, he imagined reaching up and touching the spirit bear. But he feared what would happen when he returned to Minneapolis, and there was no ancestor rock, no soaking pond, and no totem. Would he still be able to find the spirit bear? With the activity strictly limited by winter's harsh winds and bitter cold, Cole noticed his body falling into new natural rhythms. He found himself moving about at a deliberate pace without rushing. He slept when he was tired and ate only when he was hungry. Christmas came uneventfully. Cole hiked the shoreline a few days early and found a little scrubby pine tree barely three feet tall growing against the trunk of a larger tree. Figuring the big tree would eventually destroy the small deformed pine anyway, Cole chose it for his Christmas tree. He made ornaments out of aluminum foil. On Christmas Eve, Cole sat alone in front of his twisted little tree as the wind outside moaned through the treetops. Did anyone anywhere miss him at this moment? He went to bed early that night, not knowing the answer to that question. The next time Edwin visited Cole, said, Cole said to him, Christmas was really lonely. I felt like the whole world had forgotten about me. Don't drown in self-pity, Edwin said. You have more than most people. There's a whole box of your mom's letters waiting for you back in Drake. She knows you can't have mail, but she still writes every couple days anyway. How is Peter doing? He's grown more depressed. He no longer wants to get out of bed, and they have him on heavy medication. After Edwin left, Cole couldn't stop thinking about Peter. He tried to ignore his thoughts by reading from a stack of books not part of his schoolwork. Getting lost in the stories helped him to forget, but only for a while. Some days he read all day and late into the night. By the end of February, Cole had finished the last book in the stack and asked Edwin for more. Another few months and it would be time to leave the island. Still, the space at the bottom of his totem remained empty. He had to figure out what to carve there before he left the island. At night, dreams of the empty space began taunting him. One day near the end of March, Edwin stopped by for one of his visits. A cold, drenching rain had been falling all day. When Edwin stopped, when Edwin stepped from the skiff, Cole could tell that something was wrong. Edwin mumbled a half-hearted greeting as he pulled his boat safely up on the rocks. He silently picked up and carried a box of supplies toward the cabin. Cole picked up the other box from the skiff and followed. Inside the cabin, he heated water while they dried off. Edwin sat beside the window and waited until he was almost finished sipping a cup of hot chocolate before he turned to Cole. I got a call from Garvey yesterday, he said. How is Garvey? Cole asked excitedly. He said that last week, Peter tried to commit suicide. Suicide? Cole caught his breath. Why? If someone is treated as if his life is worthless, he begins to believe it. But his life isn't worthless, Cole protested. Garvey stood and with one motion opened the door and flung the last of his hot chocolate outside. I never told him he was worthless, Cole argued. Smashing his head on a sidewalk is a funny way of telling Peter he's valuable. That was a mistake, Cole pleaded. 
Edwin picked up his raincoat and headed into the pouring rain. Hell of a mistake, he called back, pu pulling on his coat as he strode toward the boat. Wearing only a t-shirt, Cole ran after Edwin. I've said I'm sorry, he shouted. Edwin stopped in his tracks and turned so suddenly, Cole nearly ran into him. That doesn't help Peter. He turned and continued toward his boat. What more can I do? Cole pleaded. Edwin kept walking, ignoring the rain and cold. I'm not sure anything can help now. When he crawled into the boat, he gave the starter rope a sharp pull and the engine roared to life. There is one way to help him, Cole blurted, but his voice was drowned out and Edwin revved the engine to steer the boat out away from the rocks. You're not listening, Cole screamed across the water. I can help him. Edwin gunned the engine and angled out of the bay, refusing to look back. As Cole watched the boat disappear into the rain, he picked up a strand of kelp off the shore and gave it a fling. Maybe Edwin was right and nothing could help Peter, but maybe if Peter came to the island, he would see how much things could change. Peter was probably terrified. That was exactly why he needed this place. He could visit the pond, he could carry the ancestor rock and carve his own totem. He could dance and maybe even see the spirit bear himself. Most important, Cole could prove to Peter this island held no monsters. Long after Cole returned to the cabin and stoked the barrel stove, he kept thinking about Peter. How had Peter cried, tried to commit suicide? And what if he had succeeded? Cole shuddered. If only Edwin hadn't left in such a hurry. Now it would probably be several more weeks before he came back with more supplies. By then, it might be too late for Peter. Cole knew that the idea of Peter coming to the island was nothing more than a desperate thought. No parents in their right mind would ever allow their son to come here alone and certainly not to stay with Cole. Not after what had happened. Even with someone like Edward or Garvey around, Peter himself would never agree to come. Cole crawled into bed but tossed fitfully. He remembered his own close brush with death and how terrified he'd been. It haunted him to think that Peter had tried to end his life on purpose. How scared must, must someone actually be to go searching for death? Cole awoke well before sunrise. He dressed and went outside to go to the bathroom. The sky was unusually clear and filled with stars, and a warm breeze rustled the trees. Cole guessed that dawn was no more than an hour away. After returning inside, he stoked the fire, then pulled on his rubber boots and his rain slicker. It was months since he had last visited the pond. He knew the icy water would shock his skin like an electric fence, but this morning he needed desperately to calm his troubled thoughts. He had fallen asleep thinking of Peter, and he had awakened thinking of Peter. Cole picked his way carefully in the dark. Life on the island had become a peaceful and almost boring routine that he understood well. Until yesterday, anyway. Now, Cole trudged along in a confused daze. Reaching the pond, he stripped in the darkness, then waded into the water without hesitation. The icy water stung his skin like fire. He tried to relax, but the cold quickly drove him to the shore. This water would kill him if he stayed in it long. There hadn't been time to breathe deeply and clear his mind. By the time Cole dressed and carried the ancestor rock, the sun had peaked above the trees. Then he heard an unexpected noise. The unmistakable buzz of Edwin's outboard engine floated over the trees. Cole took off at a dead run toward the, soap, toward the slope. What was Edwin doing back so soon? Cole scrambled and slipped along the edge of the stream toward camp. Dark shadows from the trees fell across his path and made the going treacherous. Several times he slipped on icy rocks and sprawled flat in the shallow water. Cole arrived in camp, breathing hard. He found Edwin inside the cabin, waiting calmly by the window. What are you doing here? Cole stammered, his teeth chattering. Water dripped from his wet clothes onto the bare plywood floor. What did you do, go swimming with your clothes on? Edwin asked. I heard your engine, so I ran back from the pond. I slipped some. What are you doing here? Get some dry clothes on, Edwin said. While Cole changed, Edwin sat gazing out the window, his thoughts far beyond the bay and the island. Finally, Cole sat down on the edge of the bed. Why are you here? he asked. Edwin picked at the rough edge of the table with his thick, chipped thumbnail. 
Peter tried again last night to commit suicide. His parents are desperate. Edwin placed both hands flat on the table. Yesterday when I left here, you said that you could help Peter. And you hollered after me that I wasn't listening. Well, I'm listening now. Tell me what you meant.